Hi, everybody. It's fantastic to be here and also to be given the treat of a whole presentation about the virtual reality gender gap. Usually, I have to kind of slip it into another presentation I'm doing about something else. So this is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> um, so today, I want to talk about the gender gap and why have less women experienced virtual reality. And then rather than just mull about this problem, to also talk about what we can do about it. Um, just a little bit of background on me. Um, I produced two of the BBC's first VR experiences a few years ago, back in 2015, 2016. I worked with Dan Tucker, who actually uh, spoke here about one of them last year, um, which was Easter Rising, Voice of a Rebel. And the other piece I produced at the BBC is called No Small Talk. And that project was a talk show aimed specifically at young women. So in that process, I learned a lot about gender and targeting people of different genders. Um, what is considered good content uh, within that genre um, and all sorts of uh, perspectives that people have on when you are just making something that you're saying, right, we just want to target women, for instance. Um, I found it, I suppose, increasingly frustrating, to, to be honest, working, though, on these two projects when I was making these, you know, putting my blood, sweat and tears into these projects, yet they weren't available to the masses. Broad audiences couldn't access them quite simply because they didn't own headsets. And thinking about this more and thinking also about targeting audiences and the way that virtual reality is so often, um, and I just had this real you know, sense that the um, majority of the content was made by men for men. Feeling all this frustrating, frustration, it all came together into ideas, and last year I founded Liminar Immersive, which is my company. We're an exhibition, curation, and consultancy company, and inclusivity is at the heart of everything we do. So that's enough about me. I want to talk about the problem. So there's actually two sides to this problem. There's the user problem, which is VR audiences, the people who are doing VR right now. And then there's the industry problem, the people in the industry. And the gender ratios of both of those groups are obviously interrelated. Uh, there's, there's, you know, the, the issues cross over. Uh, but it's good, I think, to separate them often when thinking about them. It makes things a bit clearer. So to start off with, on the audience problem, this is the current gender gap that we have in the UK. I imagine across uh, mainland Europe it's quite similar. 14% of women in the UK have done virtual reality versus 20% of men. And this was a study uh, by EY, um, UK accountancy consultancy firm. It's echoed in quite a few different pieces of research. So, for instance, um, Facebook marketing research, uh, one million men uh, say they're interested in Oculus versus only 380,000 women. And a study I was involved in uh, that I helped construct with um, my law firm, Wigan, showed 13% of women have done VR versus 20% of men. So I think there's enough to show there is definitely a gap there. All sorts of reasons for this, which we'll delve into. But just looking now, uh, why is this a problem? Well, the stage that we're at right now, you're probably familiar with this adoption curve and the way that new technology and di forms of digital media diffuse into society. The stage we're at right now, can you guess? It's this chasm from early adopters to the early majority. We have to, as an industry, jump this chasm and reach the mainstream in order to be sustainable, in order for all this hype and all these predictions about the money that this industry is going to make to actually turn into something. But obviously, if you're going to do that, it has to appeal to all genders. So we've got to cross this chasm. So it's really non-negotiable, I suppose. But then also, now this is getting quite statsy here, but the point I want to make is about criticism. Also, we're missing out on something really important. We're missing out on critical feedback. So this study here um, is the one I mentioned with my law firm, Wigan, uh, that I was involved in. We were, the main thing we were interested in was people's ethical concerns about virtual reality before they'd done it and after they'd done it. And something we found through every, 
every single response, trends just it was a study of 2,000 people, lots of questions asked. We consistently saw that, you see I've circled it here, that respondents who are over 55 or female were more likely to be concerned about these ethical issues. So, for instance, um, about criminality in virtual reality, uh, being, feeling guilty over committing a crime, potentially getting addicted to it, a reduced sense of right and wrong, if we have just young men doing virtual reality, then there will be less critical feedback because there will be less concern if, if we look at these survey results. So we need that critical feedback. That's part of a problem. And then moving on to the second part of that Venn diagram, the second part of a problem. This is obvious to me anyway because I've spoken at quite a lot of different VR events and a lot of them have been quite corporate, commercial, or tech-focused. And just anecdotally, there are way more men than women um, in, the, in the industry. I'm very used to speaking to an audience, very unlike this sort of audience. I look into a sea of faces, <laughs> and they're all men. Um, it does feel potentially like we might be in a really nice kind of arts, creative bubble uh, within the creative part of immersive media, where it does feel like, yeah, things are pretty balanced, but actually, when you zoom out, it's not the case. I was looking last night for some actual evidence of this, because I didn't want to just spout off and say, you know, this is what I've seen, but I wanted to, you know, find something to back this up. And I found this shocking. Last night, in my hotel room, going through Crunchbase, uh, I used their CB rank, which is an algorithm to, for influence the amount of investment that they've raised and also takes into account the amount of acquisitions that they've done. And it is quite a you know, good algorithm to look at for essentially who are the most influential companies in this space. So I looked into virtual reality and in the top 15 VR startups, there are zero female founders. It's not a great situation. And I suppose it's actually no surprise. This is a UK um, piece of research on the gender ratios in different industries that are relevant to virtual reality. It was done by Creative Skillset, who are a sort of government-funded agency. Games, you see, pretty dismal, 19% women. VFX, 26% women. Yeah, I suppose it's no surprise. But just because it's no surprise and we're used to it doesn't mean, of course, that it's not a problem. Why is this a problem? Well, think about, take a step back and think about what VR is and what it will be. Ultimately, we have the power to construct new worlds, new systems, powerful arts experiences, training tools, all sorts. But if we are building these new worlds and the people who are building these new worlds are the vast majority one gender, then obviously it's going to be woven with that gender's implicit underlying biases. What concerns me is it could be a sort of patriarchy 2.0, because if tech is a catalyst, then we could see that in our virtual spaces. And I know this is quite an extreme concern to have, maybe, that this could be the birth of a whole new form of patriarchy. Um, and it's not a nice thought to have either, but actually when you look at, into cover, current evidence of multi-user VR spaces, for instance, alt space or face, um, Facebook spaces or VR chat, the evidence so far backs this up. These worlds are being designed by men and we're finding things like this. Half, almost half, of regular VR users who are women have been sexually harassed in these multi-user VR spaces. This is research that came out today, and when, when it landed in my inbox this morning, it couldn't have been better timed, because I felt that this is really urgent issue. Urgent because women are avoiding these spaces. They don't want, of course you don't want to encounter harassment if it's happened to you before. You're not gonna go in there again. Or if you do go in there, you may well have your guard up and not be so relaxed. So, there's many I could unpick just this slide as my presentation. But it's happening already and it's probably, I mean, this is just, you know, this is very, very base level things that put women off uh, being in these virtual spaces. And it really is probably just the, the tip of the iceberg and the most visible issues. 
For me, the real dystopia is probably something like the beginning of Ready Player One, when it's 2050 and still all the most influential people in the VR industry are men. The builders of this virtual world that everybody's obsessed with and spends lots of time with are men. Okay, <laughs> now I've got a bit dystopian and not, maybe not, not particularly um, uh, upbeat. Gonna sh sh shift tempo a bit and talk about what my company, Liminar Immersive, have been up to and what we've learned about what we can actually do about this. Um, so we've done a lot of research uh, as part of our activities. Ultimately, what we're doing is building a platform for arts venues and universities to show virtual reality experiences to groups of people. Um, and in the research phase, because inclusivity uh, is something, you know, it's at the heart of everything we do, um, we have monitored uh, the way that men and women and also um, people from other underrepresented groups as well have experienced VR so that we can look to improve it, improve the entire experience. So we've been to Cambridge, for instance. This is a picture from Cambridge. We've been to um, Warwick Arts Centre. We've done a lot in Watershed, which is where we're based in Bristol. There we go, some more pictures of people doing it. And we've spoken to... Uh, well, we've shown VR to almost a 1,000 audience members, and we've had feedback forms from almost all of them. And we've run post-show discussions with 400 of them. <laughs> Those post-show discussions were basically me sat in the bar afterwards. People do the VR experience in a group, and then they come out from the VR theatre, and then they have a sort of chaired discussion with me, which feels like part of the experience, part of the, you know what they've got their ticket for, but we do also ask them afterwards for their opinions about what they've done. So the research that we've done, uh, we've learned a lot from, um, and we've actually, I suppose, learned a fair bit about how to address these problems that I've identified. So I'll talk about how we've addressed it. So firstly, it was actually quite easy to get a female majority audience from what we did. It was easy, I suppose, because, maybe because we're an all-female team, <laughs> uh, but the way we curated it, the way we branded it, we didn't have to do any sort of specific outreach work or anything like that. Um, I suppose that, you know, when you're a female curator and you put on an event, and you, you, it, it's very likely that, you know, your taste will come through in, in what is curated, and that will attract people like you. And it worked, I suppose we got a majority female audience. And this made me think that really there's no valid reason why women should enjoy VR less than men. And I don't know if that sounds like an obvious thing to say, but there's been quite a lot of conversation lately, um, actually even since, since around 2014, uh, around how apparently women's rods and cones in their eyes um, are made so that they're more likely to feel nauseous in VR. Um, apparently there's also something to do with height and posture, but apparently we're less likely to enjoy it. And I heard this years ago, and it sort of stuck with me, but to be honest, I have found no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, I went back through the comments on our feedback forms uh, to specifically look for any evidence of this, and there was none. So you may hear people say things like, oh, I think there might be something about uh, you know, women's eyes, and that's why they don't enjoy so VR so much. And in my opinion, that is BS. <laughs> um, it's all cultural baggage. So next, something that we found, and you know, this is, again, coming back to cultural baggage, and there's a study that backs this up as well, is that women do feel, when they do a VR experience, like it's not their area so much. It's not so much for them. There's this feeling of like, oh, that's kind of something that my male friends do, or that's kind of more my husband's thing. Uh, this is a study that Ernst & Young did, uh, that I keep coming back to the study because it's really useful, actually. And... As you see, women are less likely to say they invest in the latest technology. No, less likely to say they invest in the latest technology. That might, actually, might not mean that they don't. So, you know, for instance, you know, kitchen gadgets, that is quite high tech. <laughs> or hair straighteners, I was thinking, you know, that this is actually more about how people perceive themselves. But women, you see, there's quite a gap here as to how people perceive themselves. 
and we did find this in the discussion groups that women often said, um, oh, I didn't really think that this was kind of my area. I thought that VR was really for blokes. It was a kind of gaming thing. Oh, yeah, my son, he's into that. Um, and they would say, you know, you've made this relevant to us. You've made this something kind of that feels normal. So when you're thinking about why is that the case, maybe it's around marketing and all these things that make a new technology feel normal and who they're marketed to. I think a good example here is actually Blade Runner, for instance. This is a film that feels you know, ma mainly aimed at men and it's got a lot of virtual reality in it. So it starts to become normalized and if there is a majority male audience then it will become more normalized to, to experience VR. Then something else we observed, and this is backed up in this EY data as well, is that women don't really care about the headset manufacturer that much or what the headset is. Um, I suppose really that just says when you're marketing a tip, you know, don't, don't think that it's that necessary really to push on the technology, which is something I'll come back to later. Um, and this is something actually that we didn't find, <laughs> but something that is generally a observed elsewhere, which is that when women do do VR, they tend to be more underwhelmed by it and have a less positive experience, which points to the fact that maybe because there's more content which is made by men for men, maybe that's the reason why they're underwhelmed, because we haven't found that at all in any of the VR events that we've ran, that I've curated. So, some Celeste suggested solutions. First solution is to commission and make a broad range of content. Uh, you can't really see this here because it's quite small, but this is a, a slide from a consultancy project that I was involved in, where it's not actually out yet, so don't take any photographs, but we were asked by Digital Catapult, which is a sort of UK government agency, looking into immersive media and other um, emerging technologies, we were asked to map out the creative landscape uh, for immersive media and the different formats that have emerged and show, show potential for the future. And we found there are just so many. We used um, data science to get there, we used focus groups to get there, and what we came out with was this really broad spectrum of different creative formats for VR. And in our focus group testing, <laughs> again, we found you know, there was no reason why women shouldn't enjoy immersive media more than others, more than men. Um, but you can see there is just such a broad range of content. Uh, and if you commission and you make a broad range of content and think outside the box, then there is more chance that it will appeal outside of these norms and these tropes that are already developing that have often come from the sort of uh, first-person gaming environment. And According to the research I mentioned earlier, so Jessica Outlaw's research from The Extended Mind, um, she found that's the same research around um, harassment in virtual spaces as well. Um, she found that creative VR, of all the different types of VR, is the only VR that has more female audience base, a larger female audience base, than men. So, solution, commission and make a broad range of content try and think outside the box and not just think about the audience already, but the future potential audience. Then marketing. So I pointed this out already, the way we uh, communicate the experiences is we don't really talk so much about sort of show off about a tech spec. Um, and the re what that resulted in was the three quarters of audience members attending because of the content. Um, about a quarter did still say they attended because of the technology. But ultimately, uh, if we focus on the content, that also means that people are more likely to come back because it's not really just about curiosity, um, about having a go, but it's more about experiencing an art form in its own right. That's another solution. Third solution is make the virtual reality fit with something that women do anyway and something that they would consider doing as just normal. Again, normalizing it. Um, so when we do virtual reality events. Uh, we put them on in partnership with arts venues or independent cinemas like this one. Um, if you think about the sort of things that are, are just normal, regardless of your gender, um, art centers, cinemas, universities, maybe even department stores, 
And if, if you take VR to those spaces and give them a pocket of time that feels, you know, relevant and, and just a standard part of life, then there's more chance that it will feel like just something you would do on, say, a Tuesday evening, you know, with your friends. Uh, another, yeah, this is something we found, 84%, on, 76% of our audience said that they would do this again as part of an evening out. So we framed virtuality as something, a leisure experience that you would do as part of an evening out. And we thought about all the things that an evening out requires. Um, in order to make it a good evening out. So then so another thing we found, and this is our the fourth solution, final solution idea to put forward, is just make it comfortable. <laughs> we put so much thought into this about how can we make this really, really comfortable, physically, mentally, for everybody. And to design it for somebody who doesn't feel like an early adopter and doesn't feel like this is their space. Not necessarily um, gender related, but we did find it um, in our feedback forms that women said they felt more anxious beforehand. And what we came out with was 84% of people saying they felt very or extremely comfortable, which we're really proud of. <laughs> so how do you apply that to your practice? If you're considering making VR, if you are making VR, you're gonna put VR on in your venue, is think about the privacy of the space. Maybe people don't want to be watched doing it. Maybe it doesn't need to be something, a sort of spectator sport. Um, think about things like, where's my bag, you know? Is it safe? Do I know it's safe? Is my coat somewhere hung up where I feel, okay, it's not in the way, I'm not gonna kick it. Things like that. Do I know if I can bring children along to this event? Has that been communicated to me in the marketing beforehand? Um, all these things that can impact how comfortable you feel, physically and mentally, are really important to take into account. Um, then also, from the headset manufacturer's perspective, and other VR accessories, um, thinking about things like, uh, you know, will this headset remove makeup <laughs> uh, from somebody's face? You know, is that a problem? Uh, I've seen headsets get quite disgusting covered in kind of a foundation mark, <laughs> um, including mine. <laughs> I thought, that's funny, because these spongy materials, they are so, they're just like a makeup sponge, they're designed to soak it up. <laughs> um, gloves and hand sizes, thinking about things like that and designing it for, yeah, for, for both genders. So here's really where I want to conclude, which is that the future is not predetermined. We're not necessarily going to end up in a world like Ready Player One or a world like Blade Runner. It is ours to shape. There is no reason why it has to end up with all the cultural baggage of the other industries from before. And technically, we do live in a more equal and inclusive time than ever technically, <laughs> so we can learn from the mistakes of the past and we can apply that to the beginning of this new industry because immersive media is a really new art form and it's still malleable. At my company, Limina, we've managed to be conscious and try as hard as possible not to bring the baggage with us. I suppose we've proved that it's possible in fact we've had a happy female majority audience. But the rest of it, we can do it, the rest of the industry can do too. And ultimately, we can, together, build a VR industry which is reflective of a population and reflective of a population's vibrance and diversity. So thank you very much. Are we doing questions? If you have any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. One is about, you said at some point that creative VR were the part of VR where there are a lot of uh, women. Yes. And I didn't really realize what it was, so maybe you can explain what oh is creative yeah. VR. Actually, this slide. This slide is a, I suppose it doesn't really mean much because you can't see the text. <laughs> um, but when we, we were asked by Digital Catapult to map out the creative immersive media landscape, and because that hasn't really been done before, no one's really kind of answered that question in the UK. Um, and we found these different formats, which might give a sense of what is creative VR. 
So pieces that we visualize testimony in an artistic way, um, bringing to life archive content, best seat in a house. Uh, that's a format where you can experience performance, uh, feeling as if it's live, um, maybe close up. Uh, access all areas where you get to go to spaces that you wouldn't otherwise be able to go to, you know, caves or coral reefs, et cetera. Um, wonder and education, educational experiences that are also very wondrous, sort of, you know, wonders of the universe style thing. Uh, this kind of content, I suppose. As a position to what kind of content? Uh, <clears throat> so in the study that um, Jessica Outlaw did with, uh, that I was talking about earlier, which she classified other content, there was um, gaming content, multi-user VR environments, uh, tools and utilities. There was another ca category I can't remember. Um, therapeutic experiences and education. <laughs> I think that's it. That's off the top of my head, but yeah. But yeah, it was the only out of that list. It was the only um, category that had a majority female audience, which is quite something, I suppose. Okay, and the second question I have is uh, about the statistics that you have presented. Uh, did you compare them to other fields, and which fields did you compare them? Because there are a lot of fields where there are more more men than women, and uh, like VR is a very specific topic, and you need com points of comparison in any industry to compare them. So, who did, did you compare to something, and which industry did you yeah. compare to? Which statistics are you talking about? The ones that Limina did from our uh, own. The one you like. Uh, for the, the number of women uh, that are in, like, the one in the very beginning with the 20... Let's get... Ah, yes. Uh, I haven't... Com this one. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to admit, I haven't actively compared that. It would be a good piece of research to do, wouldn't it? Just to do that with lots of different forms of emer emerging technology and new digital media. I suppose for kind of more established forms of media, you know, film, <laughs> for instance, or fine art, it would look a lot closer to 50-50, yeah. But um, I can't remember the stats, but from looking at other forms of emerging technology, this is, is quite common for emerging technology. It's all about, you know, who perceives themselves as an early adopter and who, who has that as their kind of sense of self-identity. Okay, so it's not statistics that are specific to VR, but much more in the tech industry in general. Um, this is, this is VR specific, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I've seen, I have seen generally that it is a, an, a problem across the board with emerging technologies, high tech, you know, that term is so associated with men. And if you think about like, you know, where gadgets are marketed, it's always uh, the men's magazines. Uh, and, and if, yeah, so it's, it's a sort of, I suppose a standard thing. In fact, there's, all, there's even a shop in the UK called Menkind, which just sells gadgets. <laughs> It's like gadgets for men, high tech for men. I heard that in a, a, a VR, women are more, more likely to, uh, to be subject to motion sickness. Uh, do you know that it's true if you have uh, stats on about that? Yeah, yeah, so I, I mentioned that. Sorry, I may have been speaking a bit fast. <laughs> Lots of stats to pack in. Um, we haven't seen any evidence of that whatsoever, zero. <laughs> And I looked through, specifically for this presentation, looked through all our feedback forms, because there's like a free comments bit, you know, where people can just say if they had any issues. or And there was no trend that women felt more nauseous. Women were more worried about feeling nauseous, <laughs> but there was no actual evidence of them feeling more nauseous. So it's, I don't know, maybe the, the biology point, which is often being made, is a kind of actually a pseudoscience, potentially. Maybe uh, just men are not likely to tell they are subject to motion sickness. Yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> Et ben, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.